Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second day of the Race Prefer Race Symposium on Education. Um, my name is Jonathan Xu. I am a member of the Race Prefer Race Executive Board. Um, I would like to thank Ayanna Thompson and ACMRS for bringing this uh, conference together. Um, I, I would just like to uh, begin uh, this uh, session uh, by a, a land acknowledgement. Um, I am physically here in Washington, DC, which sits on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples, among other indigenous communities, past, present, and future. Uh, since our theme here today is education, I would like to signal how much the Race for Race community continues to make me think my own ethics and teaching practices as a non-Indigenous person of color. And I'm very moved by the power of BIPOC communities, that is Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities working together in coalitions like this one. Um, we've had some very wonderful uh, conversations in our opening sessions uh, last night, and I look forward to continuing these conversations with our two invited speakers, Terrell Campbell and Marion Galleria. Now, I will not list all their accomplishments right now because they are in the program, but on a somewhat personal note, I'll say I'm just very glad to be here in this convo uh, conversation with Terrell and Marion, who are both wonderful educators as well as scholars and activists. I remember first meeting uh, Terrell as the uh, prime mover of a conference at St. Louis University, University honoring Bell de Costa Green and Medivis of Color in the field. And Marion is the founder and director of the Race and Pre-Modern Period Speaker Series at UC Riverside. And we've had some initial conversations about that. I'll tell you some more about the, um, some uh, announcements related to their work later at the end of this session. So to proceed with our conversation, uh, we'll start in the order of the program. First, Tarl, and then Terrell, and then Mariam, and then followed by a Q&A. Uh, the audience members who are watching today uh, can send in your questions here uh, using the Q&A tab uh, to activate captions if you need them. Uh, click the CC link uh, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, just a reminder that this event will be recorded and posted onto YouTube afterwards. Uh, and if you'd like to follow on Twitter, you can follow the conversation using the hashtag race before race. Uh, that's B4, B, and the number four, race before race. So with no further ado, I will hand things over to our first speaker, speaker Tara. Hello, hello. I am Terrell Campbell. Good day, good people. <clears throat> it's one of the only venues where I get to talk about African American literature and medieval studies at the same time. So bear with me here, people. Bear with me for a second. Shout out to the MOCs. All right, let's do this, people. Um, Richard Wright's Native Son is published in 1940. I'm sorry, my flight. Is, my my talk is entitled "Lines of Flight: Delimited Points of Entry Within the Academy." Richard Wright's Native Son is published in 1940. After two years of brooding over what he perceives as the failing of his previously published work, Uncle Tom's Children, Wright arrives at the conclusion, Wright arrives at what he considers a work reflective of his own constructed literary aesthetic, an aesthetic that is anti-aesthetic insofar as it will seek to push art beyond mere contemplation. Uncle Tom's Children, a collection of stories, all but one of which had the same pattern, a Negro was goaded into killing one or more white men and was killed in turn, fails to satisfy Wright as an author and as an artist. Wright's dissatisfaction with Un Uncle Tom's Children stems from public and critical response to the book. He feels that the book inspires more pity than terror. He writes, I found that when I had written a book, which even banker's daughters could read and weep over and feel good about, the reception of Uncle Tom's children brings Wright face to face with his own inner tension about literary expression. He views literary expression as a criminal activity, which has to be carried out under the shadow of what he calls a mental censor, product of the fears which a Negro feels living in America. Joseph Skerritt claims that Wright fears disapproval from white audiences and black leaders. Nonetheless, Wright swears if I ever wrote another book, no one would weep over it. 
that it would be so hard and deep that they would have to face it without the consolation of tears. Native Son is that book. The writing of Native Son becomes an exorcism from forces both black and white that attempt to limit and censor rights literary expression. The writing of Native Son and the construction of Bigger Thomas in part reflect Wright's deepest aggressive drives regarding literary expression. My approaches to uses of medieval and pre-modern theoretical approaches mirror Wright's motivation. The exorcism from forces both black and white that attempt to limit and censor my scholarly output, production, and expression. Some new critics of the 1940s in particular sang the praises of Native Son. Placing the novel in the naturalist tradition or the realist tradition of social protest. New critic Harry Schlokauer highlighted the realist portrayal of Black Jews as he interpreted bigger and Black Americans in the novel. Charles Glickberg understood Native Son as objective realism and understood bigger to represent and emphasize Black hatred towards whites in America. Edwin Burry Burgum reiterated Glickberg's position and placed Native Son and Bigger Thomas in the realist tradition of the Negro literature of protest. In the 1943 essay entitled The Promise of Democracy and the Fiction of Richard Wright, Burgum gives a cursory explication of the works of the most intrinsic, most intrinsic, most intrinsic representative of America's submerged nationalities, as he refers to Wright. The essay seemingly accepts hatred of whites as an essential characteristic of the Negro. Moreover, Burgum confesses that the quality of intransigence, also essential to understanding of the new Negro, is hardly palatable to the whites. In a Deleuze and Gatorian framework, bodies such as Bigger Thomas are designated for categories for which they function, and in the process are constituted as things, as commodities. Body, bodies and their categorizations and their functions are prescribed by language rather than referential. Burgum is one of the earliest white new critics to prescribe the categorization of bigger as real. He bases his exertion on the understanding of the aesthetic expression which governs the idioms and cadences of Negro speech and reflects Negro sentiments in such genuine detail that its Negro origin can never be mistaken. I find Burgum's stance preposterous because he attaches essentialist qualities to black modes of speech and sentiments, suggesting that there is an absolute gulf between white skin and black skin, suggesting that there is a genuineness to blackness. For Burgum, Native Son provides an authentic understanding of the black individual. This understanding is facilitated by Burgum's belief that there exists an unspoken assumption that Negroes must have some common protests that shall enable them to bring the abstract into the specific. And although Burgum suggests that Bigger Thomas, of course, is not the typical Negro in one moment, he states in the next moment that as a reader, he accepts Bigger as representative of other men unlike himself in various ways. For example, Burgum understands Bigger's hatred as the hatred shared in varying degrees by every Negro. He accepts this characteristics of Blacks as the general situation as it exists. He accepts Native Son, interpreted in part as a result of the actions of Bigger Thomas, as the story of Negroes' negative achievement in America. Now, I bring this up because I can go on and on and on, but ultimately, what we arrive at is a generic, that is, with regards to genre, clarification of Native Son as realist literature or naturalist literature. During my graduate studies, I attempted to make the argument that Right and Native Son should be included within the halls of high modernism. As you can probably imagine, I got laughed out of many uh, a thesis director's uh, 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 office, right? Because high modernism is thought to begin with Ed Edmund Wilson's uh, Axel's Castle in 1931, right? European high modernism is considered the repository of all that is great in European and American literature and Europe and America in general. It is the world of the genius, the world of high culture above the usual particular way of life. The high modernist literary aesthetic finds important the valorization of literature's national character the way in which a particular literary work contributes to the exfoliation of a national identity through emphasizing the nation's literary tradition as a whole. Literature and nation are two manifestations of the same cultural idea. 
As representative of the highest thoughts and values of the nation, literature becomes the nation's spoke person, the, the means by which the most important qualities of a nation's identity as a people may be known and understood. The exclusion of right from the period of high modernism seems to acknowledge the new critics' dominance and power as custodians of modernist culture, which they identify with their notions of organic form and their values of unity, wholeness, and balance. The, wide, the widespread influence of the new critic notion of modernism and the new critic exclusion of what is not modernism has led to the domestication and nationalization and appropriation of all that is new and distinctive in modernism by those identified as European and American. In 1940, this was white males, right? So modernist American literature, as opposed to African American literature and high modernism combined uh, represent the site where high modernism's pledge of allegiance to a transhistorical canon founded on the subordination of gender, race, and class differences to what T.S. Eliot idealized as the universal mind of Europe is most evident. Modernism is much too narrow a way to describe the culturally vibrant period between the two world wars and 1940s America. Yet modernism functions perfectly as a force field keeping a select few texts in the American canon of modernism and high modernism and those unselected out. Richard Wright as an artist and, an, and Native Son as a novel do not reflect the universal mind of Europe like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, Joseph Comrade, for example and are therefore considered neither fully American nor fully European. Because of the historical relationship in America between the white mainstream and African Americans, of course, what Du Bois refers to as the color line, the possibility of full American identity for blacks does not exist. Each attempt on the part of the white mainstream to protect what it conceives as its cultural identity denies full participation in full America by, <laughs> denies full participation in a full American identity by blacks. So although personally Wright feels as though white colonizers could not have done a better job of liberating the masses of Asia and Africa from their old age traditions, he is still not admitted into full Americanness. Even as a knowing black man, thankful to Mr. White man for freeing him from the right of irrational traditions and customs, white is denied entry and full participation of an American identity. Now I apologize. I shared this lengthy episode from a period during my studies uh, my master's program because I have found the fields of medieval and pre-modern studies to function in many of the same ways as high modernism in the 1940s. We have gathered here to discuss those same ways. We gather here today to discuss, analyze, and evaluate medieval and pre-modern studies, particularly as relates how we teach our fields, why we teach our fields, and whom we implicitly and explicitly include and exclude in the process that we seemingly explicitly dissuade black students and scholars from our fields while simultaneously we seem to invite and to motivate white students and scholars to join the fields in manners so nuanced and implicit as to function in normative ways has been documented and discussed, right? We know this. About two years ago, Mary Ram, <laughs> my apologies, MRO, Mary Ram Brand, Olam uh, uh, gave a talk at Race Before Race that highlighted how gatekeeping in early English studies continues to stunt the field's growth and prevents fresh and or innovative scholarship from developing, that the field is heavily weighted to favor literary and linguistic scholars, and that the attention that literary scholars receive in early English studies is problematic in itself, limiting our understandings of the past by not collaborating with scholars from different subfields. While we are beginning to know the stories of Toni Morrison and Stuart Hall very war well with regards to pre-modern and, uh, and, and medieval studies, let us applaud Mary for spurring more research on Gordon David Houston and the delimited choices made available to him in early 20th century America as relates to scholarly attempts to practice within the domains of Middle English and Old English. Still, one of the more recent queries into Hall struck me and serves as a sort of jumping off point as regards the issues that I wish to discuss today with respect to how we teach our fields, why we teach our fields, and who we include and exclude. In New Ethnicities and Medieval uh, Identities, I believe is the name of the article, Kathleen Levezo writes, Stuart Hall provides a helpful means of correcting two problems that appear in existing work by medievalists who discuss race and ethnicity. One, they often fail to distinguish between two terms, between the two terms, that is race and ethnicity, and two, they at times support fantasies about essentialist identities. 
that there still exists confusion as regards the different meanings of race and identities, of, uh, race and ethnicity among scholars is certainly a valid point. Those practicing at, as medievalists are not the only groups confusing the two terms. Just the same, when it comes to the participation of black scholars like myself, whose works discuss race and ethnicity, Lavezzo's position centered on the support of fantasies about essentialist identity strikes quite a chord. Perhaps due to the ambiguity of language, Lavezzo seemingly neglects what Richard Wright highlights, the understanding of black expression as a criminal identity, which has to be carried out under the shadow of a mental censor, product of the fears which a Negro feels living in America. Also, when Lavezzo writes of essential identities, in many respects, she is signifying on the black male writers post right and black female writers post 1970s. That is, those who were positioned to make generative literary uses of overdetermined aspects of their very identities as black that came into existence as a result of the civil rights era. And in my estimation, in many respects, she's signifying on people like Morrison and Tony K. Bombara and Audre Lorde and so on and so forth. This is problematic. To be black in America is to exist within the realms of the essential, for blackness functions as the rep repository of the non-normative as regards human endeavor. Blackness is the essence of that which is not white. It is the denotation of black that projects upon these non-normative bodies their essential critical characteristics and criteria. Black bodies, such as my black body, or Morrison's black body, or Hall's black body, are designated for the categories for which they function. And within the academy, black bodies, at least histor historically, have not been designated for categories associated with the study of pre-modern and medieval studies. As has been pointed out by scholars like Dorothy Kim, Matthew Gabriel, Sierra, Lamo Sierra Lamuto, Jonathan Chu, Cord Whitaker, and, and Mary <laughs> MRO, with respect to medieval studies and pre-modern studies, each and every separate subfield has historically been comprised of white people. Racist gatekeeping has even e either prevented those of us who are seen as others from entering the field or rampant racism has forced other marginalized scholars to pivot. Scores of students and scholars of color have left the fields. Moreover, medieval and pre-modern studies stagnate intellectual growth while losing out on intellectual richness offered by a varied scholarly community. In the case of Hall, even scholars like Levezzo seem to lament the loss for the fields of pre-modern studies and, pre uh, and, and medieval studies as regards Hall's occlusion and exclusion. The new ideas and new approaches to the pre-modern and the, and the medieval offered by a varied scholarly community, at least during Hall's times, are irretrievable and lost to us forever. The products resulting from Hall's line of study centered on the use of contemporary theoretical positions with respect to the medieval could have been exciting and groundbreaking. I know that I believe that many of the ideas that I have attempted to develop and to pursue within the academy have groundbreaking potential. And while scholars like Morrison and Hall were interested in utilizing contemporary theoretical positions to investigate aspects of the medieval past, I am interested in using medieval and pre-modern theoretical positions to investigate our more contemporary moment. Consider an analysis of the discography of Jay-Z read against the landscape of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, utilizing the concept of translatio imperii. Or consider the fruitfulness of reading Douglas's narrative against the landscape of Milton's Paradise Lost. Or consider the use of Deleuze and Guattari's abstract machine to analyze the development of the Angleson only to legitimize the advent of the African-American people. I imagine that many of you are making the same faces that my advisors would make. Just the same, this exclusionary practice as regards the presence of BIPOC bodies and ideas within the medieval and pre-modern fields is problematic as regards the expansion of our collective knowledges and scholarships. Take, take for example, the medieval as found in Jesse Fawcett's Plum Bum and Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Now, Plum Bum uh, is a novel by African-American novelist Jesse Fawcett. Okay, sorry. The novel makes generative literary uses of romance and the fairy tale while exploring aspects of domesticity, racism, sexism, and capitalism. The novel's protagonist, a young light-skinned black African-American woman named Angela Mary, leaves behind her past and passes for white in order to attain fulfillment, which includes her desires to become the housewife of a wealthy white man. I developed the project focused upon the hidden transcript 
I developed the project focused upon the hidden transcript as discerned in Plum Bum as regards what I understood as Fawcett's implicit critique of the binary options available to American women uh, of the early 20th century. The choices between the harlot and the angel, the choices between the hussy and the housewife. Now, in the politics and poetics of, trans, of transgression, Peter Sallybrass and Alan White highlight the hidden transcript and its roles and functions as found in um, plays of the York Corpus Christi cycle and its function as relates to carnivalesque along with the use of drama as a platform for the hidden transcript of groups subordinate to the dominant ide ideologies which structured medieval English society. The authors argue that powerless groups have a self-interest in conspiring to reinforce hegemonic appearances. As a result, every subordinate group creates, out of its ordeal, a hidden transcript that represents a critique of power spoken behind the back of the dominant. In its most recognized form, the hidden transcript, one, is specific to a given social site and to a particular set of actors. Each hidden transcript is actually elaborated among a amongst a restricted public that excludes certain specified others. Two, does, does not contain only speech acts, but a whole range of practices. And three, represents the frontier, uh, a zone of constant, uh, represents the frontier, a zone of constant struggle between dominant and subordinate ideologies. The hidden transcript could therefore be understood as that which represents an acting out in fantasy of the anger and reciprocal aggression denied by the presence of domination. So when Lavazzo talks about living out fantasy, she doesn't know how much she hit the nail on the head. I digress. My project centered on the idea that Plum Bum dis uh, displays the hidden transcript as regards the binary choices of harlot, angel, housewife, hussy, hussy afforded many American women during the early portion of the 20th century, particularly African American um, women. Moreover, aspects of the medieval permeate the novel. Formally speaking, for example, explicit discussions of fairy tales are present. When Angela and Virginia were little children and their mother used to read to them fairy tales, she would add an ending. And so they lived happily ever after, just like your father and me. Other explicit generic aspects associated with medieval lit literature center on the romance subplots between Angela and her several bows. But it is the implicit critique centered upon hussy and housewife, along with the function of silence throughout the text that piques my interest and concerns and inquiries. And these concerns can only be addressed if one recognizes that hussy is a contracted modern word deriving from a compound word of old English origin. The, con the contraction of hoos and weef to give us hoosie. If one does not recognize this, this area of analysis does not open itself to us um, for exploration. The Color Purple by African-American novelist uh, Alice Walker, uh, The Color Purple um, by uh, Alice Walker and published in 1982 takes place in rural Georgia and focuses on the life of African-American women in the South during the 1930s, including a woman by the name of Suge Avery. The, no the novel explores a number of issues relevant to African-American women, particularly the exceedingly low social status afforded Black women in America. In the novel, Suge is explicitly referred to as a hussy. The community preacher uses Suge as a lesson telling the congregation about a strumpet and short skirt, smoking cigarettes, drinking gin, singing for money, and taking other women's men's, talking about, talk about slut, hussy, heifer, and street cleaner. Suge's name is Dirt, and the rejection of her mother is synonymous with her community's rejection of her for her choice of freely loving. Moreover, Suge's lifestyle, her lifestyle as a hussy, check this out, is what keeps her from be, being able to marry, becoming a housewife. Now, how ironic is it that Suge's actions as a hoosweef are what keep her from becoming a hoosweef? I think they're trying to tell us something here. I think they're trying to tell us something here. What's my time looking like, Jonathan? Five minutes, okay. Now, I'm a little long-winded here, right? But I, I tried to develop a multiplicity of other uh, projects at um, while I was doing my graduate studies. Um, and, and Percival Everett's Erasure, um, the, the novel's protagonist is a guy named Monk Ellison. Make a long story short, Monk Ellison is a black dude who writes on things that include everything except stuff centered on blackness. For example, one of his, no uh, one of his novels that he's wrote is, is, is called The Persians, right? So he's focusing on these, on these classical aspects of literature um, and he keeps getting rejected 
by all of uh, the publishers that he sends it to. And, and the reason why he keeps getting rejected is because they have no idea what Aeschylus and the Persians have to do with the African-American experience. Moreover, when Monk, when Monk walks into a Borders bookstore, he finds his books in the store but they're not categorized under the subject matter that they represent. His books, which have nothing to do with the quote unquote African-American experience are all categorized under African-American studies. So it is my argument, um, and, and there are some other uh, tangential uh, uh, references to the medieval throughout the novel. Monk and one discussion with his father refers to him as Laroy. Um, I tried to make the argument that there's uh, what I think Pierre Bourdieu would refer to as uh, social capital going on here in the vein of, um, if you all remember when Matilda and Stephen were fighting over the English throne, well, it was basically social capital through the reading of the text that focused on the Arthurian legends that kind of helped them sess out who should get the who should get the throne. And so I tried to make arguments about uh, Monk's father uh, preferring Monk over the other children through his display of these aspects of social capital as they would play out in medieval times. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, there were my attempts at, uh, at uh, using Deleuze and Guattari's abstract machine to help explain the development of race amongst the Anglican only to legitimize uh, the advent of African Americans. Um, this, this had a little bit more success, but that had to do with the fact that I was under the tutelage of Dr. Elaine Joy at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, who was a little bit more liberal in my attempts to merge these two, uh, these two subject areas. Um, I'll be more than happy to discuss other uh, projects that I, as a student, have been denied. Um, but one last thing I want to say about how we teach and what we teach. As, a, as, a, as an instructor of writing and a professor of rhetoric and composition, many students of color come into my classes intimidated by, their, uh, 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 by being charged with writing in the standard English format, right? And, and particularly when it comes to my black students, they fear being labeled as speakers of Ebonics, right? And so in my studies, you know, we all got to study the history of the English language. I come across these nomic universal uses of bead, right, within the Welsh language. These, 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 um, and, you know, Tolkien, uh, Tolkien and others, I think uh, Marco Philip are going back and forth about whether or not the Welsh influenced old English speakers or whether or not old English speakers influenced Welsh speakers, whether or not who influenced who, through a whole bunch of syntax morphology and so on and so forth, we still have this use, this nomic or universal use of bead or to be in our language, right? And it shows up in Ebonics when my children, when my students say things like, I be doing my homework or my mama be working all the time. And they get criticized for speaking Ebonics and they get criticized for not speaking standard English, right? And what I want them to know is that's probably the result of some Gaelic descended Highlander of Scotch Irish origin working as overseer on some plantation that perhaps one of their descendants was on who taught them English and utilized the nomic B. And they've carried that with them as living artifacts in these here United States to the present day. Baby, don't be ashamed about that. Don't be ashamed about that. We are amongst some of the only people walking on these here grounds in these here United States that can reflect the origin of this country from its inception. Promote that proudly. I digress. Um, our next speaker um, is coming up here shortly. Mariam, the floor is yours. I apologize for going over. Not at all. Thank you so much. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Take a moment to think about your relationship to language. I ask that you continue to reflect on it during my talk. As many writers and scholars have noted, language is rooted to culture and it binds a culture and its communities over time. Language is often understood as the vehicle for passing down tradition. It shapes our identities, the way we think and how we see the world. For many, language is a home an attachment to family and country, 
and it can feel like a place of security and comfort. But language can also dispossess, disenfranchise, isolate, alienate, and even traumatize a person and a people. Language is a racializing technology. Thus, it structures experience in inequitable ways. As an immigrant and a subject of diaspora, I have a fraught relationship with language, both with Tagalog, my first language, and English. For me, both these languages represent what David L. Eng and Shin Hee Han call a double loss, or, quote, the estrangement from language, both native and foreign, end quote, consequent of immigration and assimilation into American ideals or the ideals of whiteness disguised neatly as the American dream. At a young age, after getting in trouble with the teacher and then my parents were not learning to speak English at school, uh, I began to understand English as equaling betterment. It is the language of opportunity I learned um, of success and a better life and happiness. It represents access to opportunities, success and a better life things my parents felt were not available in the Philippines. In contrast to English, Tagalog became a site of shame. It was everything English was not. It would not provide opportunity, freedom, success, or a better and happy life. As E.J.R. David shares in Brown Skin, White, Man, White Minds, he began to distance himself from Tagalog and from unassimilated Filipinos or FOBs for fear that associating them would undo his efforts in becoming more American, more white. For me and many other Asian Americans, language becomes a crucial aspect of our identity. Likewise, unfortunately, language is also how others negotiate and determine who we are. The English language as a site and medium for community and culture is not a universal experience. In fact, that language is a racializing technology. It is also a site of racial trauma or in terms of racial melancholia, a lost object that represents the ideals of a dominant culture, the ideals of being American or white. In using the concept of racial trauma, I draw on David L. Eng and Shin He Han's work on mourning and melancholia in a dialogue on racial melancholia. In this text, they argue that Freud's melancholia presents a quote, compelling framework to conceptualize registers of loss and depression to both psychic and material processes of Ameri American Asian, um, Asian American immigration, assimilation and racialization, end quote. However, unlike Freud, Eng and Han argue that racial melancholia as a process of assimilation is a fluid negotiation of being where the subject resides in a liminal state of being. <clears throat> um, where they are processing mourning and melancholia simultaneously. As Eng and Han point out, immigration is akin to mourning, and what is mourned is a loss of national, familial, and individual identities and bonds. As a subject grieves, melancholia emerges in the assimilation process, which demands the same subject in their grief to adopt the dominant norms and ideals, whiteness, heterosexuality, middle-class family values, often foreclosed to them, end quote. Thus, for Asian Americans, oftentimes the demand to speak English impeccably, to master it accent-free, is a necessity to belong and to succeed in society. Ocean Wong reminds his audience during an interview that, quote, the price of admission into English is so high, end quote. From his own experience, he shares that the English language, quote, is such a destination for so many refugees, end quote and that he has witnessed folks in his community risk and lose their lives in order to speak English. I would expand the loss of life here to encompass the loss during immigration and assimilation. An admission into the English language happens at the cost and loss of a mother tongue, but at the same time, language becomes a vehicle through which to find ourselves. Wong, inspired by Coleridge, who uses poetry as a way to learn about oneself, reflects, quote, what would happen if I were to use language towards self-knowledge? He recognizes, however, that, quote, the stakes are very different because for us, self-knowledge is a difficult challenge because the books written about us, particularly about Southeast Asians, are often about, often by white men. And even as they write about us, very rarely do we see ourselves in that writing, end quote. 
If language is a form of self-knowledge for those who experience a double loss, how do we as educators address these readers' conscious or subconscious drives in our pre-modern literature classrooms, especially when oftentimes the literature we teach touch on the Greek maxim of know thyself? How familiar are we with Asian American students and their experiences in a university or literature classroom? How do these students engage with pre-modern literature? How do our classes on Chaucer, or Shakespeare, often required classes for English majors enact racial trauma? So I want to talk about the English language and how the written word and its orality are sites of inclusion and racial melancholia. I'm interested in how the English language, the text on the page, reminds some that they are not part of a dominant white community that cohere around the English language. I'm interested in thinking through the ways we make the classroom inclusive, our literature inclusive, our methodologies inclusive. When we have students and even scholars who feel or are treated as being outside of the English language community. Where I teach at the University of California, Riverside, understanding language and its potential for enacting racial melancholia is crucial for me as my students are predominantly students of color who live in homes where English isn't the only language spoken and oftentimes not the primary language. So I'm interested in the ways language excludes, subjugates and alienates students and how pre-modern studies can often engender racial melancholia by, by the very fact that our students enter a Shakespeare or Chaucer or pre-modern English literature classroom that is housed in an English department where a core assignment is often a form of English composition. How much more alienated could you feel about language and about literature when you're not white and you have to study these canonical texts? Bearing these in mind, I intentionally turn our focus to a relatively unknown early modern text that uses language to render Asian as a perpetual foreigner, a myth and experience common to Asian Americans today. I turn to Francis Godwin's science fiction novel, The Man in the Moon, posthumously published in 1638. It is violent in its linguistic erasure and colonization, and for me, it is a reminder of my own foreignness and alienness. In The Man in the Moon, a Spanish uh, nobleman named Domingo Gonzalez accidentally lands on the moon, and in his attempt to return home, he accidentally lands in China. When Gonzalez lands on the moon, he meets the Lunarians, a Christian race with quote, the most pleasing color and countenance, end quote. Depending on their height, they can live up to a thousand years or at least to a thousand years, thus suggesting they are an ancient people. Godwin's description of the Lunarians is standard ethnographic profiling found in travel writing, including descriptions of what he hears. In describing the language, he tells his readers that the Lunarian language consisteth not so much of words and letters as of tunes and uncouth sounds that no letters can express. For you have few words, but they signify diverse and several things, and they are distinguished only by their tunes that are, as it were, sung in the utterance of them. Yea, many words there are consisting of tunes only, so as if they lift, they will utter their minds by tunes without words." End quote. This description of orality and musicality of the Lunarian language resembles that of commonplace European explorer descriptions of Amerindian cultures. During the early modern period, travel writing often focused on the natives' so-called musicality of rituals, marked by adjectives like the word Gonzales uses, uncouth. Lunarian language is, for Gonzales, uncouth, denoting that which is unfamiliar, strange, unattractive, unpleasant, uncultured, ignorant, and alien. What becomes apparent here is the way in which language is, language is used to racialize a people. This is nothing new to the early modern period because of Renaissance humanism. In classical Greek, barbarous first denoted not Greek and developed into meaning, meaning not classical or pure and thus unpolished, uncivilized and without literary culture. The Athenian empire distinguished themselves racially and hierarchically through language when they deemed their Persian enemies as barbarous. Linguistic barbarism as a racial technology reemerges during the English Renaissance through the revival of classical studies. However, the term barbarous, barbarous as Margot Hendricks and Ian Smith next, um, I pointed out, was commonly attached to an idea of Africa and African. Smith argues that Renaissance England's revival and investment in classical study developed what he calls Renaissance neo-barbarism, a racial logic of language that would be applied to African speech. Lunarian language is further rendered 
to an oral culture because the tunes can't be expressed by words and letters. There's no writing system. Orality often takes on the sense of primitiveness and backwardness and even anti-progressiveness because it suggests a society's inability to modernize and develop. Writing systems, as Albertine Guar argues, is a form of information storage and was intended for in administration and commerce, but, it's in it's in but in its capacity to keep records, the writing system evolved into preserving religious, legal, commercial, and everyday literature. This is not to say that the oral tradition did not have an information storage unit. Orality stored or retained information through repetition. However, with a writing system, Guar points out, societies would be divided into information rich and information poor communities and would create an imbalance of power and equity. For early modern England, writing becomes an important mode of power, inheritance, legacy, and futurity. Godwin's Lunarian language, its orality, becomes a racialization technology to subjugate an ancient race on the moon to the earthling languages with writing systems. When Gonzales accidentally lands in China after departing the moon, he provides a description of the Mandarin with a tone of suspicion that echoes commonplace stereotypes of China, such as their craftiness. In describing Mandarin, um, the language, Gonzales reports are like that of the lunars did consist much of tunes, end quote, thus drawing similarities between both languages. However, Gonzales's description of the Lunarian language's tonal expression echoes commonplace early modern accounts of the Mandarin language's tonality, which would prompt readers to see how both the Lunarians and the Chinese could be seen as one as this one in the same. In Godwin's construction of the Lunarian language, he draws on Mandarin's signifying tones and recombines and represents it with commonplace tropes of European and British first encounters with primitive native peoples. Drawing this parallel between Mandarins and Amerindian maps on the rhetoric of savagery, backwards and primitiveness onto China. Through this triangulation of perceived Amerindian, Lunarian, and now Mandarin orality, Godwin subjugates all languages in the text, except perhaps the invisible English language and writing script on the page. The English language has always been there, translating all the foreign languages for the readers. In this Orientalist project where Europe constructs an inferior and backward Orient, the Lunarians and the invisible Amerindians serve as allegorical figurations of the Mandarins. In essence, the Mandarin language in The Man in the Moon is relegated and reduced to an oral culture, to orality. Godwin's representation of Mandarin as oral, like the Lunarian's tongue, is a moment of cognitive dissonance that must be examined closer. For while tone was viewed as a dominant characterization of Mandarin, the Chinese writing system was understood by Godwin's contemporaries to be its, its source of power and universality because of the way in which it could be understood across China's vast provinces. It is this quality of written Mandarin that makes the language technology of interest and mystery for the English. Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit missionary who lived in China, learned Mandarin and wrote that the Chinese script is universal among the provinces and other countries. Ricci also noted that some of the symbols, quote, have the same sound and pronunciation, though they may differ much in written form and also in their signification, end quote. And it's use of accents and tones that serves to lessen what he calls the difficulty of equivocation and doubtful meaning, end quote. This removal of the difficulty of equivocation and doubtful meaning sounds much like what Francis Bacon wanted from a novel universal language, which could directly represent reality without that troublesome difference between words and things. Could Mandarin have been perceived as that kind of technology? What would it mean for China to have that technology long before England had its own? It may appear that this crossed Ben Johnson's mind uh, in his mask, The Entertainment at Britain's Birth, staged in 1609, the master of a China house proclaimed as much to his sellers, or to, his, um, to sell his wares. Quote, oh, you're Chinese, the only wise nation under the sun. They had knowledge of all manner of arts and letters many thousands, thousand years before any of these parts could speak. Sir John Mandeville was the first that brought science from thence into our climate and so dispensed it into Europe and such hieroglyphics as these, end quote. Similar depictions of China circulated early modern England, suggesting that China was a model empire. 
Godwin's Orientalist project doesn't end with erasure, however. Godwin not only erases the Chinese writing system from his novel, he writes a script for the tonal language to replace the actual Chinese writing system. After Gonzalez learns the Lunarian language, he helps readers imagine this language by using musical notations. In effect, Gonzalez creates a kind of visual pseudoscript and English translation for the Lunarian language and analogously the Chinese language, thereby committing the tonal and oral language into a written one as well. In the first musical notation, Gonzalez translates the Lunarian tonal signification of glory be to God. On the facing page, Gonzalez translates and writes his name using musical notations. This language is also a cipher, something Godwin was into, and the notes represents uh, alphabetical letters, which I've added in red. Returning to the translated phrase, Gonzalez not only assigns musical notes to tones that represent letters, but also imposes a Western grammatical structure of word order. In addition to the script, Gonzalez uses this language to assert Lunarian's Christianity. He establishes the Lunarian's relationship to writing and God in this instance to privilege Christianity and the, world, the word of the Bible, which for the English render the Lunarians as superior to the Chinese who are further excluded and made perpetually foreign or perhaps unassimilable and alien to that of the Christian Lunarians. Godwin's careful representation of his main character's purely oral and aural interactions with the Lunarians and the Chinese people makes clear that this multilingual Spaniard character, not only an explorer and discoverer, but also a creator of a new language writing technology, which Godwin conveys in English for those who might read the text. In the end, China appears safely behind English and Spanish civilization in the linguistic te technology race through Godwin's transformation of Mandarin through its selective mirroring in the Lunarian language. <clears throat> Gonzalez's process Gonzalez's process of rendering a tonal language visible, his concretizing how it might be scripted for people outside of the Lunarian race's comprehension and imagination undermines the Lunarians' ownership and sovereignty over their language. The potential consequences of a people losing control over their language involve the way in which their knowledge is produced and transmitted, the way in which people are racialized, civilized, or barbarized. By design, the parallels to the Mandarin language in Moon ask readers to deem the Mandarin language as deficient and inferior to the European alphabetical writing scripts and the tunes and uncouth sounds as incomprehensible and thus alien, or I'm sorry, Asian as alien. It's the Asian as alien for me. Asians as alien prompts my racial melancholia. It reminds me of my own double loss of language. In Godwin's text, the tunes and uncouth sounds of language marks a people primitive, backwards, and alien. This recalls how Asians and Asian Americans are often marked as alien through language and how they are often rendered perpetual foreigners. And my own university language and race seem inextric inextricably linked in teaching evaluations. Perhaps it's fair to even say institutionalized. In numerical evaluations, one assessment asks students to rate how their instructor's command of the English language impedes their learning of the material. And in the parenthetical note states that this question only applies to foreign language sections. While I demonstrate a command of English and I've assimilated and erased my accent as a dutiful immigrant, I will often receive one or two marks indicating that I have a poor command of the English language. How might these, how might these evaluations teach students to perpetually read foreign bodies as having incomprehensible language skills? How should I negotiate being seen this way at the end of each term? Beyond teaching in seminar, it wasn't uncommon for me to feel as though my inability to comprehend material or a comment was a cause of my status as a second language learner. That was my go-to explanation, never mind that I was reading something that was dense or jargony. For our own students, I'd like us to consider their own experience with language in the classroom or the university. Jenny J. Lee, an assistant professor at the Center for the Study of Higher Education at University of Arizona, reports that Asian international students have, quote, described reactions of frustration and contempt from faculty, students, and administrators for their language accents, end quote. Lee continues, quote, too often, a foreign accent, particularly Asian accents, 
was equated with stupidity and sometimes even ridiculed, whereas European accents were more tolerated and appreciated, end quote. This doesn't sound like a welcoming academic environment, especially when international students are often recruited by our institutions. In a study on Asian American student experiences at school, Asian American students have reported avoiding Asian international students for, being, for fear of being mistaken as international students themselves. Asian American students often hear what white students say about Asian international students, and this in part shapes their own experience with language as a double loss. As I wrote this paper, I began to fully recognize the subtle ways in which I performed perfect mastery of English, spoke impeccably, to demonstrate to others, to white people that I've assimilated and to feel that I belong. In my own reflection, I wonder how language operates in our classrooms. How inclusive are we if we assume everyone's relationship to language is the same? To return to Godwin's text briefly, The Man in the Moon seems to shape an idea of Asia, one that American fiction writers have inherited. The Man in the Moon exercises the commonplace depictions of China as crafty, deceptive, and a technologically advanced and wise empire, but one that must be controlled and subjugated. This language recalls 20th century yellow peril fiction. Stephen Hong Sun argues that in figurations of Asian as alien, quote, the alien stands as a convenient metaphor for the experiences of Asian Americans, which range from the extraterrestrial being who seems to speak a, in a strange yet familiar accented English to the migrant subject excluded from legislative enfranchisement, end quote. I'm also reminded of Toni Morrison here when she argues that American inherited an imagined Africa. And so I've begun to wonder how we've been inherited an idea of Asia. I'd like to close on a different note by returning to Ocean Vuong's interview with Suvankam Famavongsa for the Toronto Public Library Asian Heritage Series. Famavongsa shared her own personal experiences with language as self-knowledge. She shared that for the first time she read about Laos was in a history book. There were no pictures, no narratives, just a footnote. Wong asked her, quote, how did you write yourself out of that footnote? The moment when you said, oh, that's where I am, buried at the bottom. How did you look at that footnote and ask more of it? I think I've always been searching for myself in early modern texts. I've been using language as self-knowledge without even realizing it. It's why I'm interested in travel writing. A couple of years ago, I found something of myself in Hacklet. Upon Tam Thomas Cavendish's return to London after his successful circumnavigation, he brought home with him two young Japanese men and three young Filipino boys. The youngest was, a, was gifted to Francis Walsingham. I've since been searching for more about this boy, but the deeper I've gone into this search, the more I found myself traumatized by the language I would read. How do I do this research when the language I have to work with is rife with wounds? As students, educators, and scholars, how do we write ourselves out of a footnote when the language we use can't be our own? How do we use language to get out of the footnote when our language is delegitimized or incomprehensible? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mariam and Tara. Um, these were just wonderful thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so much to think about, so beautifully delivered. And I just want to say I very much appreciate that these were two papers where I get a sense that you are really speaking uh, as your whole self, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, in, in, in both of these presentations. And I think that's very rare for us as BIPOC uh, scholars to be able to do. And uh, I'm just, uh, I, I would just like to acknowledge that that uh, line you end on, uh, Mariam, on this idea of like, how do we write ourselves out of footnotes? And I think that's a really great question, you know, for us to think about and that you leave us with. Um, I see that we've already got a few uh, questions coming through. Um, but before that, I'm just going to like take a moment and uh, after I finish talking, post a few, oh, sorry, post a few, um, choice quotations, two from each presentation that I think are very great, uh, very good, and we can ponder uh, collectively. Um, there's just three very short themes that I'll, I just wanna pick up on to just try and uh, get things started. Um, 
One um, that I thought was actually very much, very interesting uh, that it, it only emerged kind of through this talk is this, is this question of uh, who is an alien, right? So who counts as a medievalist, a Shakespearean, a modernist, you know, when marked BIPOC racial identities are at play, right? So if BIPOC students and scholars have always have con contested belongings in quote, you know, coded white pre-modern fields, uh, European Anglo-centric fields, then how do we actually get around that? How do we navigate our identities that are always being pressed into these essentializing categories, right? Or modes of expression. Um, I'd like to think about that question of, you know, how do we think about themselves? Are we aliens? Are we invaders? Like, you know, can we actually think about uh, th that in, a, in another way? Um, the other major theme, of course, that I picked up on here, and especially given Terrell's great riff uh, on bead <laughs> uh, here, is this question of language as a racializing technology or a system of power, right? Um, how do we think, especially as BIPOC scholars who were experts at code switching, right? How do we actually think about the resources we have in navigating languages, homelands, communities, how, how do we actually navigate those systems of power? Okay, so those are just two big questions that I'd just like to start off with, this question of, of what is the alien? What is it to be an alien? And this question of um, code switching. So I don't know if either of you want to pick up on that or want to ask each other questions uh, or, uh, or we can just start with it. Do you wanna go? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to pick up on this question of code switching. Um, it used to really bother me. Um, and what I mean by it really used to bother me is that um, as Mariam, Mariam pointed out in her presentation, you know, I've, I've, I've one of those bodies that's pretty much been in predominantly white institutions since I was in the seventh or eighth grade, right? Um, and I and I had one of those, two of those grandmothers who always told me, now don't you go out there and embarrass me in front of those people, right? And so <laughs> I didn't want any of the quote unquote ghettoisms, hoodisms, any of that to ever rear its head. It wasn't until I started doing medieval studies that I let that go actually, right? Um, when, um, cause I had, um, I had, I had uh, interactions with Rickford out at Stanford and his linguistic projects, you know, on Ebonics. And as, as, um, as useful as that project was meant to be, it always left me with a bad taste in my mouth. And so when I started learning about the, uh, you know, the coming of the, the Saxons and their great adventures and going through, and I started getting caught up in this language thing. And I discovered that my last name Campbell meant crooked mouth in, in one of the old Gaelic uh, forms uh, of Scottish, right? Um, it means crooked mouth in that, and it means beautiful field in French. I, um, I was like, okay. So I guess in a sense, I was writing my way out of the footnotes, right? Um, I was like, okay, there, maybe there's something here. And when I came across that nomic use of B, it, it just, it allowed me to open my students up, you know? All of them, I mean, a lot of their contemporary rap songs. I mean, Nelly's from St. Louis. He in country grammar. He um, he's all he's using the nomic B all throughout it, right? Um, um, gin tonic and chronic B my this this and then the other, and I be doing this. And so my students did. This is a part of who they are, right? And I wanted to I wanted to unleash that to them and allow them to make generative uses of that. And um, and studying studying the morphology and the changing of of the of the language, particularly the Indo-European languages as they went on, you know, and they got kicks out of being able to get them to see how knee was connected to genuflex and things of this sort, right? And so uh, to answer your question, um, um, Jonathan, I, I I stopped looking at it as a weakness and start looking at it as a power, and I intentionally do it in all the spaces that I am in now. Or shall I say, I don't police myself or censor myself from code switching, right? I might be in the middle, I might be, right? I might be in the middle of a lecture and, 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 and drop and signify on some, some contemporary pop culture thing because I know my students know it, right? And it'll give them an entry path into this very hard thing that we're studying, the type of entry points that were denied to me and my kind when we were in their positions, right? So, you know, 
So I hope that, you know, kind of answers the question. I guess I'll touch on this idea of being alien. Um, you know, when I just reflect on my own experiences during coursework, it was always interesting that I felt somewhat odd in a seminar with a lot of other white students. And um, in some ways that, that feels like you're in a footnote sometimes because the work that you're interested in working on doesn't come up in discussion or um, it's relegated last to talk about maybe the last few minutes you know of seminar um, and it wasn't until I spoke to my professor Sohn, um, you know he made me realize that one of the reasons why I probably feel odd in the class feel like an alien in the class is because I am the only BIPOC student. And after that, it just made sense that to get out of that kind of footnote in a seminar, you had to find your, your BIPOC friends who understood what it's like to be in those seminars and stuff. Great. Uh, th thank you for that. I mean, I, 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 at this point, I'm just kind of looking at these questions here. We have a lot of really uh, interesting questions that have come in here. Uh, let me see if I can, um, let's see. All right. All right. Uh, this is bridging to, um, uh, this is a question um, from, let me just post and post this question here. All right, this is a qu question from uh, Brandy uh, Adams, and it's actually directed to Mario, but I think it's, you know, both of our speakers can address this. Um, both these talks were uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, th this question is directed for Mario. Um, my question is for how do you think through the manipulation of print to express racial difference? And how do you think about white writers, printers, and publishers endorsing the racialization of print? So I guess we could start with Mary and, and then see what uh, Terrell has to say too. So if I understand the question correctly, you're asking the manipulation of the print of the text um, as a racializing effort, I think. Um, I actually haven't really thought about that as much. Um, I do think a lot about the language being used, the way it's repeated sometimes, and, and how it gets recycled and used to continually perpetuate ideas and to racialize others. Um, I know that you're very into book history, so I, I would probably say that I'm out of my field when I'm trying to think about the actual print itself. Um, but I will say that, you know, it's interesting to think about a text written in English and it has everything to do with other people. And yet English is always that invisible but not invisible language that's there trying to really just racialize everyone else. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I'll try to adjust, I know it wasn't directed to me, but I'll try to address a tangent of that question. Um, the racialization of the publishing industry itself is problematic, right? And so hopefully um, <laughs> this quarantine and the advent of uh, information technologies and platforms will continue to democratize that process a little bit. But this is what Everett hits on in Erasure, right? Um, the categorization of black bodies as a result of overdetermined understandings of blackness, right? I mean, here he is writing on classical and pre-modern subjects, the, the, that is the, the character in the novel here the the black novelist is black male novelist is writing on classical and pre-modern subject matter but no matter what within that, that those fields he writes on they classify him under african-american studies right and so until we can until until the gatekeepers you know and it has to be some coming to jesus moment with them i suppose and so the gatekeepers does have a desire to widen the gates some 
you know, it's going to continue to be problematic. I mean, just the other day, I'm in a forum dedicated to medievalists, and somebody asked me if I was a medievalist. I'm like, what do you think? I'm just hanging out here because I don't have anything better to do, right? And so, um, and so, you know, it is, it is what it is. One of my graduating institutions, the people who granted me my certificate and degree in medieval studies, were shocked that I was a medievalist. Like, like, come on now, people, right? You know, and if, so. You know, when it comes to the 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 mechanic assemblage that is that is responsible for producing medievalist, we have we have some skewed lenses that we're looking through that must be that must be rearranged, right? I mean, we're missing out on all types of of potential scholarships and a multiplicity of fields because doors are being shut down and, and interests of inquiry are being negated by the powers that be. Right. While while anybody and their mother, it seems, is allowed to write their way into Arthurian history or Arthurian legend or anything de dealing with the fall of Troy or anything dealing with, you know, going off to fight in Troy. You just write yourself a narrative just right in there. I was descended from Achilles. Let me write something. Right. And it gets accepted. All right. So I digress. Um all right. Um, wow, there's a lot of really great questions here. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, uh, I'll just go to this uh, a, a question um, uh, from, um, let's see. Uh, OK, um, I'll just go to, to this question here from um, De Delaney uh, Harrington. And, um, and, with, and uh, I'll summarize this. Um, um, the question is essentially, what is uh, the effect of racializing or other uh, diasporic languages where an individual doesn't have a clear relationship with a homeland, so for whatever reason, so that is you've been historically displaced um, or because of transatlantic slavery or the homelands no longer exist <laughs> politically, or there's languages that are not notated, like uh, ASL, are not notated in, in ways that conform to alphabetic forms of writing. Okay, um, so that's a broad, uh, a question uh, here in terms of describing language as uh, as uh, in a, um, a, a languages that don't have a home. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that question? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I'll take a stab at it. All right, because I think, um, for better or worse, perhaps Ebonics fits into that. Um, you know, um, Ricora talks about this idea of implicit and explicit signification, right? Um, and to make a long story short, written discourse, because of its explicit nature, gets gets to become the repository of cognitive thinking and all and all of those great things and and um, implicit discourse which I, I'm guessing that some of these language systems might fall into um, being more symbolic being more pictorial being ideographic um, historically they've come down to us to not you know represent the, the pinnacle of uh, cognitive thought but in read and record, there's an argument to be made for the value of any metaphorical utterance. Um, um, if you can particularly, um, particularly when it comes to like displaced and pictorial and ideographic type languages, um, um, because the metaphorical or utterance can allow us to make uh, analysis of the vehicle and the tenor. I guess so. So in an attempt to try to uh, answer this question, you know, it, it comes back it comes back to the analyst and what they can read into the material. And that may not give you very much solace right now. I don't know where you are in your studies, but you know, we've got to become a little bit more intrepid in how we see the world, our world, our world views, how we intake sensorum and spit it back out. So with regards to whatever it is that is concerning you that led to you asking this question, I would ask you to flip it and ask yourself, what am I not doing 
to help bring some sense of this to the surface because only you know the motivating factor of why you're asking that question more intimately than any of us All right so i'm i get i'm, I'm done <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, Delaney. Um, you know, I have a similar experience with Tagalog, even though it's my primary language. I still, I still feel very, almost disconnected um, from it. And so, if I were to answer from my own personal experience, you know, when you're not, when you don't feel connected to a language that gets denigrated or racialized um, as uncivilized or just doesn't sound pretty. Um, you know, you get mixed feelings. For me, as someone who had to assimilate um, and fit in, um, like EJR David, I felt like I needed to distance myself from that. And so there's this pain and loss and continual loss that you, in effect, recreate because you're trying to fit into this other dominant ideal. Um, but then there comes a point when you are drawn to it and you don't know what to do with it. And so I guess you know, when I go back to Eng and Han and the work that they've done, it's always that conflict and trying to negotiate that experience with language. Um, um, so I would say it's always that conflict. Um, there's, you can try to feel connected to it, but then you also feel this draw that you can't because you need to be able to do this other thing. And there's also this intergenerational kind of trauma that happens too, because, you know, I want to make good on all the things that and sacrifices that my parents have made and so it's like i have to continue to assimilate and hold that up because they've sacrificed so much and so i have to continue to distance myself from that language um but at the same time it's one of the ways that i can kind of feel connected to them so there's that that trauma and that conflict both personally socially and within your own family and, and if i can add just one last thing here you know African-American literary tradition itself is the result of having no real language system and making generative use of that, right? So I guess I kind of take it, um, take it for granted that it can be done because you want to talk about being displaced from language systems and the trauma that come along with it and having to work in the dominant system that you are distanced from. I mean, yet we have Toni Morrison's of the world, right? And so, um, that's a lot of years of pain and, and hard work, but at the core of it, the reason why I come back to it, at the core of it was a desire to make generative uses of the products around us, just like ham hocks and chitlins and snoops and pig feet. You know, the, the, these people that I am descended from found a way to make generative use of this language system that had been projected upon them while their own tongues had been cut out. And, and, and we can celebrate the beauty and the aesthetic of it. So, so once again, you know, I, I hate to not have an answer answer, you know, it's what is driving you with regards to this loss, you know, play, play modernness for a second and search for it, knowing that you will never probably find it, but let it, let it drive you, you know. That's great. Thank you very much. I mean, this leads to the, uh, this question of double loss, if you think about racial melancholia, right? Especially with Asian American uh, cultural studies, but also um, Black diasporic studies, this idea that whiteness, the, you know, is a seemingly unattainable ideal, right? It, 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 and as well as the concept of a re return to an imagined homeland that we can never access, right? So being caught between those spaces, right, is the condition of double loss. Um, I, I'm picking up on this discussion. Um, Amberine Dadaboy uh, uh, has a question here about um, thinking about um, models of um, decolonization. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, post the question here, but the summary summarize the last bit of it. Uh, she's referring to Tango here as a post-colonial writer who's rejecting English. So, and we, that is, we who are pre-modern scholars, we're actually here talking in English, right? We do not. So are there ways that we can challenge the colonizing impulse of English as medieval and early modern scholars?
I guess it's a big question, but it's a, it seems to be a, a deep one. <laughs> it's particularly it's particularly problematic for me because I have so much invested in following the English language, right? Um, years and years of trying to figure out how this thing works. So I guess I never really, I guess I, I've, I've, I've spent so much time in what, what Dorothy has highlighted as the undercommons, trying to figure out how to navigate the undercommons within you know, this world of Englishness that I've, I've, I've never really thought is there a possibility to let it go, All right? Um, what you got, Mariam? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm stumped on that one. It's a great question, Ombreen, of course, as always. Um, I'm reading it in the question box. Um, so are there ways we can challenge the colonizing impulse of English as medieval and early modern scholars? Um, I mean, the only thing that I've got that I can imagine is always providing some kind of counter narrative um, in a way um, to challenge the centrality of English, to introduce other writers, to introduce what they've said. But the problem that too is that, you know, those are translated works. So if we don't have the language skills, we can't translate them ourselves. And I can't imagine that even putting its original and its translation on a facing power on a PowerPoint facing each other, that that does any good either. But maybe really talking about, I mean, if you really wanted to really think about it, you understand the losses in that translation. So if you're familiar with that translation, you could talk about what's lost, maybe pick up on a word, have students research a particular word in both senses that they can, and then talk about what is lost, what is what is missing, what can't be expressed. Um, I always think about this one example from La Maravilla, Alfredo Vid talks about, like in his, off, um, one of his characters, the abuelo, you know, he speaks Yaqui and also um, Spanish and English. And there's a point in that text where he's explaining the very difference of each word and the sense of it, because language does shape how we think and see the world um, and how he thinks in one language, speaks in another, but feels through another language. And when I think about seeing that on a single page, because I always tear that page out and I teach it to students too, um, is what do you notice about the loss here, you know, and how do we incorporate that into our own medieval and early modern scholarship? Um, maybe something similar? <laughs> um, that's answer. You know, I'm not, I don't know if this quite, the question is so elevated. I'll, I'll tell you one of the projects that I do with, with like, when I was in high school as a high school teacher and what I kind of do with my freshmen, right? And this is just an attempt to, um, to try to knock English off its pedestal as, you know, with its, its pedestal of supremacy. You know, English is such an uh, acquiring language, right? It just gobbles up terms and stuff from, from other languages. And, and um, particularly when it comes to medieval uh, words that come out of the, the medieval era, they generally are imported from somewhere else too. So a lot of et uh, uh, word history and um, um, etymology, <laughs> I'm gonna mess this word up. A lot of looking at the etymology of, of words takes, um, takes place in our, in our class, especially when we are learning, you know, the differences between formal analysis and maybe African-American analysis and feminist analysis. When we're doing the formal part, there's a lot of, Let's go to the Oxford English Dictionary on, on things. And they notice how many words that they take for granted, you know, and they use in their everyday, in their everyday uh, 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 parlance comes from someplace else, right? Um, and so maybe, maybe in, in that vein, we can begin to knock that down, but I'm waiting for y'all to come up with something to tell me what to do. Along those lines, Carol, I'm also thinking, and on Maureen's question, um, what if we had students translate a single line from a text in their own native language? And if they, if English is their only language, then they pick one and try to translate it and see 
but just in the act of doing that, where is the violence? Where is, you know, the loss? Um, in many respects, no, that new version of Beowulf is a rift on that, right? It's like Beowulf written, I mean, it's, it's written in bro speak, right? It, it would be nice if it was written in something else and it's still English, but it is, it, it, it required a, a translation of Beowulf that took into account, you know, differences in feeling and so on and so forth that might be lost between the, the chronology of the two translations, you know? So you might, yeah, yeah, it might work. It might work. Yeah. You know, particularly with the demographics and type of students that I come from, I teach a lot of international students, right? Um, and so that might actually make reading something from the medieval period more exciting to them, right? Um, one of my colleagues named Ron Austin, he has this book out called Avery Coat is a Snake, a Thief and a Liar, right? And it's really a, it's really a, a collection of short stories, I would argue, but he would kill me for saying that. But anyway, I bring it up because he has all of these, these references to the medieval in there, right? And, um, and I made my, I, 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 I selected the categories that my students would research after reading this text. And I made one of the categories, the medieval, right? And so they had to go, and it was, it, was, it was one of the more enjoyable experiences that they had because once they discovered what he was referencing in the text, they went and researched that thing and, and, and made their sense of why he was bringing it up in the text. And so, you know, maybe we'll get a couple of medievalists out of it. Well, I think we just have uh, one uh, last question and kind of combining something that's coming from MRO and from uh, Barbara Bordalejo. Um, Barbara is asking uh, the question of what, how do we actually think about the heterogeneous individual relationships to language in the classroom? And uh, Mary Rembram Ohm is asking, you know, what can we as BIPOC scholars do um, more than just being bodies in the room, you know, what can we act, what, what, what can we do more than that uh, to create new forms of solidarity? So any version of answering those final questions. Miriam, I hate to keep dominating going first. You wanna go first, my friend? <laughs> I'm processing. <laughs> um, I, I, so if I, um, could you repeat that, Jonathan? Sure. So Barbara's asking about uh, strategies to navigate individual relationships with language in the classroom. Um, and the thing that um, I wanted to point to uh, here is, uh, this is from MRO. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so uh, she's asking um, how do black and other non-black POCs, scholars in the white field, um, help shift when there's so much resistance in the field? Uh, what do we do that's apart from just being bodies in the field uh, and creating solidarity amongst each other? Amongst each other? Um, I, to answer, address the first question about how do we navigate um, the individual relationship to the language when we have these heterogeneous bodies, I think, in our classrooms. Um, I, think, um, I think one of the things that I've benefited from um, is working in a number of writing centers across universities, um, across America. Um, I've always tended to um, find myself working with whatever the uh, international or different or other uh, demographic of students were. Um, for example, I've worked with a lot of Southeast Asian writers. And in order to help them in their relationship with standard uh, writing in the standard English format, I had to learn how they wrote in their native ways of approaching composition, right? Like, like for example, I learned that a lot of my, my Southeast Asian writers, they don't at least what they share with me is they don't think necessarily in linear fashions. So this essay that we're trying to get them to write that we usually present to them in some type of outline form that goes from one to two to three to four and you 
put your main argument and so on and so forth. In many respects, that wasn't how they were used to receiving their, their training about how they go about um, creating composition. So after, after learning, you know, the ways that they uh, were used to go about doing things, I was able to translate that into what they needed from me to try to address what their professors were desiring from them in the standard written format. And so um, beyond, yes, we need to do things beyond merely being present, but I don't think we ever wanna devalue just how valuable our presence in these areas are. Um, because a lot of these students, I end up working with them because nobody else works with them for whatever reason, right? And if, if, if you're not there to take out the time and figure out who they are as people and where they're coming from, forget their relationship, the, the English language, you're not gonna be able to help them with their relationship to anything, but with respect, uh, particular uh, respect to that question. And what can we do um, with regards to the resistance that we um, find in the field other than just being, I'm on a I'm on a thing of not asking for permission anymore, man. I'm like, if you want to, whatever you think you want to do that floats your medieval heart, let's do it, right? I'm I'm like I'm tired of asking people for permission to. Do you think I can do this like that? And don't get me wrong, I'm gonna hold myself to the criteria of the the scholars in the field and what we've deduced as making sense, but. I'm not asking permission to do anything anymore. So if I wake up tomorrow and I have an idea about this and I think that it rocks, I'm sending shooting out emails to see if there's anybody who wants to get down with it. I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, so to Barbara's question, um, thank you, Terrell, for letting me process. <laughs> um, I was trying to save you. I was looking out for you, man. I was looking out for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess there are two ways to answer your question, um, Barbara, as far as strategies go. Um, when it comes to a Shakespeare class, for instance, um, you know, in terms of thinking about language, we take it step by step. I show students often that the language is difficult, it's challenging, we go through it together. Um, but I also like to assign um, Marcus Gonzalez's um, essay on was it, Caliban never belonged to uh, Shakespeare. And he talks about language and the relationship of the characters within the Tempest. So, you know, in a Shakespeare class, I would assign that and we talk about language in that way. Um, I've taught a lot of composition classes and that's where I get more, most often a lot of international students and um, uh, BIPOC students in general. And from what I've noticed is that a lot of my international students tend to be very quiet. Um, and in those classes, I approach this in very different ways by assigning texts that, you know, uh, stories that address like a relationship to language. Um, and we talk about the issues and themes in that text. Um, when it comes to helping students feel comfortable with language, I don't want to force them to have to say anything aloud. We do note cards where I ask them to write something down and I collect them and I will bring them up and I'll share it unless they want to share it themselves. Um, because I, I think sometimes students might feel uncomfortable speaking out for the very reason that they don't want to be ridiculed for their accent or anything. And so I don't force that upon them. And so gathering, you know, assignments beforehand where you can create a discussion or take ideas and, and you know, um, share what they've shared is one way, I guess, as a strategy for uh, teaching in a classroom. Wow, that was an amazing uh, panel both in terms of the kind of theoretical historical work that you all were laying out, but also some of the kind of practical advices um, that we can use in our classroom. I'm deeply appreciative um, to you, Terrell, to you, Mariam, and to you, Jonathan, for uh, moderating this panel so graciously. Um, and thank you all in the audience. We miss you so much um, and uh, hope to 
not see you, but be with you in some way tomorrow. Remember that our schedule has a slightly different time frame tomorrow. We start at one o'clock Mountain Standard Time, um, and we have three speakers tomorrow. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Terrell. Thank you, Mario. And thank you, Jonathan. Bye, everybody. <laughs>